As we begin, I want to look at Hebrews 19, 10, 19 to 25 with you. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 25. And I want us to read this, and I want us to pay careful attention to what is going on here. What is going on? We have spent, we have spent several months in the book of Titus. Does anybody know when we started the book of Titus this year? Yeah, we've spent several months in the book of Titus. 29 messages, they're all available on YouTube. You could go on our website, there's an archive. In fact, if you wanna look for other sermons that we've preached in the past, you just go on our website and they're all there. So I invite you to do that. But especially Titus, and we focused particularly on the contemporary relevance in the Bible. I hope that through the book of Titus you saw that the Bible is relevant for us. Even though this was a letter written some 2,000 years ago, it's relevant. We also looked at the call for choosing and maintaining faithful church leaders. So what does it mean to be a pastor? What does it mean to be a deacon in the life of the church? Well, Titus answers that first question, what does it mean to be a pastor? And then the other letters teach us what it means to be a deacon. And I hope you're praying more and more for the pastors and the deacons of this church. I hope you're praying. And perhaps you're thinking about becoming a pastor, a lay elder in the life of the church. I hope you're praying uh, more and more for this to happen. We also looked at the transforming power of grace in the gospel. And I say grace in the gospel because it is that theme of grace in the book of Titus that captures our hearts. It is grace that transforms us. It is grace that causes us to live lives of holiness and righteousness. And it is grace that finally, ultimately, can present us before God himself. And it is through that, that work of grace that Jesus Christ did on our behalf on the cross through his resurrection that we can have fellowship, community with God and with each other. And then finally, we looked at God's ultimate priority for good works in the lives of true Christians. Now that phrase, good works, is an important phrase in the Bible. It happens fewer than 20 times, and when we see that phrase, good works, we should immediately think, we should be triggered to think, this has very practical implications for my life. And one of them is, as you will see in this text as we read it, good works happens in community, or as I've titled the message, Christian community and good works. So where do good works happen? Where do good works happen? Do they happen when you're by yourself with Jesus? I don't need the church, I just need Jesus. Uh, do they happen when you're uh, doing charitable things for other people, apart from any community? I don't need a community, I can do this on my own, I can carry this weight by myself. Is that when good works happen? Well, we'll see this morning that actually good works happen primarily in the context of Christian community. So let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25. Get a pencil or pen or whatever your preferred method of writing. Maybe it's your finger on your iPad or your iPhone. And let's read this text. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Just circle faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now circle the word hope there. Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And you can underline that because that is a promise in itself. Right? He who promised is faithful. Faithful to do what? Well, faithful to work out all these purposes in our lives as Christians, right? And then verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love. Circle the word love. And good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, I've had you circle three words, faith, hope, and love. Okay, you see that? Now, this happens quite a bit in the New Testament. It happens most popularly in 1 Corinthians 13, right? Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. 
And what we see here is the final command. There's three commands here. Let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider. The final command is the command of love. It's the command that pretty much encompasses what Christian community ought to look like. And we'll see that a little bit more as we go on. But we want to turn our attention to particular aspect, a particular aspect of good works. Okay, so I want you to see this as kind of the umbrella. Good works is an umbrella here. And one aspect of that umbrella, one, one aspect that goes underneath that is Christians in community. Did you know that this morning, as you come to church, you are following a good work. You are doing a good work. You, if you went to growth group this morning, you are committing a good work. If you encourage somebody, a brother or sister this morning, you are doing a good work. I want us to see that good work happens when we rub shoulders with each other. Oftentimes we think of Christian community as like a, a bag of marbles. They all just kind of slide past each other. You know, everything is, is disconnected, disjointed, and it's slippery. So I, I can never kind of be in fellowship with a group of people for too long because we just kind of all have our differences and we're just gonna, you know, when you throw a marble at another marble, it just bounces off, you know? It reacts. But actually, uh, Christian community is a lot like grapes on a vine. We're all connected. We're all connected organically to one another. And so what I want us to see this morning is that good works happen organically. We're not just random, a random assortment of marbles. You know, you'll be the blue one, I'll be the red one, you'll be the green one. No, we're all grapes part of the vine. In fact, that's how Jesus referred to us as abiding in him, right? We are, we are trusting, we are abiding, we are clinging to him organically. So I want us to see that community is central. It is a key part of good works for the Christian. Now Hebrews shows, the book of Hebrews, let's just take a big, big picture here, okay? The, you know, the book of Hebrews in the next five minutes. Uh, the book of Hebrews has 13 chapters and it shows in 13 chapters the centrality of Jesus Christ in every believer's life. The centrality of, of Jesus Christ in every believer's life. Now, the author is assuming that you know something about the Old Testament, okay? So if you don't know something about the Old Testament, let me just catch us up very briefly. The Old Testament starts with God creating the world, okay? Amen? Yeah, everybody read Genesis verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It begins there, and then there's this huge progression. By the end of the Old Testament, you know who God is. There's no doubt. You know he's loving kind, he's patient, he's joyful, he exalts over his people, he loves righteousness, he loves holiness, he's a God of love. And when you get to the first half of the book of Genesis, by that point, you already see God has made a promise to a per particular man named Abraham. And God has made this promise, he said, through you, Abraham, I'm gonna bless the world. I'm gonna give you land, I'm gonna give you an offspring, you're gonna have tons of people. I mean, as far as your eyes can see, as the sand on the shore, as the stars in the sky, you will have a people to yourself. And then we keep going on, so we go to the next, the next big, big shot in the Old Testament is Moses. And Moses is considered the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, the greatest prophet. So then Moses, this guy shows up, and uh, God comes to him in, in Exodus chapter three and says, I want you, Moses, to, to bring my people out of Egypt, out of slavery, I want, you to, I want you to redeem them through my power, through my witness, through my signs, I want you to go to Pharaoh, I want you to say, Pharaoh, let God's people, let Yahweh's people go. Okay, and Moses is like, okay, who should I, say, who should I tell Pharaoh sent me, you know? Whose messenger am I? It's all that Moses really is, a messenger. And God tells him, tell him I am sent you. <laughs> you know, I am sent you. I am who I will be. I am who I am sent you. What a powerful statement. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, God is the creator, the one by whom all things exist. So Pharaoh, the one who created all things and by whom all things exist, including you, 
Notice how Pharaoh's never named in the book of Exodus, but God is. It's a statement of world power, world domination, and who is the, the, the main character, the main mover, the main shaker? It is God. And so what happens? God calls Moses, he says, hey, rescue my people. He does effectively rescue the people. Ten plagues, last one, kills the firstborn. And everybody's really, they're just wondering, how in the world did this happen? And the Egyptians send the Israelites out. They send them with treasures. They're like, here, take all of our possession. Just get out of here. And they, they're running away. They're going. And then they cross the Red Sea in this miraculous sign, this beautiful picture of God's redemption. And they get to a point where they're praising God in the wilderness and then start complaining. It's, it's within chapters. They get saved by God through this miracle and then they're complaining. They're like, we don't have steak out here in the wilderness. All we have is this sweet bread, manna. So it's not that they didn't have food. It's the type of food they wanted. They were classic Americans. I mean, just they wanted, they wanted, they didn't like McDonald's. They wanted Burger King. And when they got Burger King, they wanted McDonald's. They, they just couldn't make up their mind. They were just complaining. And so God says to Moses, okay, here's, here, listen, let's, let's, make a co- let's make a covenant. And this is Exodus 19, 20. This is where you get 10 commandments from. He says, listen, I'm going to promise you Israel. I'm going to promise Israel. I will never forsake my people. I will never abandon my people. I will never do it. Now, I want you, as a result, Israel, as a result of being saved miraculously from slavery, I want you to do these things. Not do them because you need to be saved by doing them, but because I've already saved you. So God calls them to obey the Ten Commandments. And then you got a couple of chapters, then you got the tabernacle, which takes up half of the book, which tells you what the book is about, God's presence with God's people. And it is in this book, Exodus, where Hebrews draws from. And Hebrews is telling us that God sent angels to give the, command, the Ten Commandments to Moses. And God used Moses as the instrument, the vehicle, the, the main person through whom he would make this covenant with his people. And God not only did that, but he loved the Israelites, but they were so hard-hearted. They were so stiff-necked, is what the, the book says. And not only that, but God also gave them a sacrificial system that if they ever did mess up the law, like if they didn't, you know, if they just had an urge to steal and they always stole, they could offer a sacrifice and be forgiven. And that whole system was so elaborate and so detailed and so particular. You know, that's where the book of Leviticus comes from. That's where you get your classic, you know, atheists who don't like the Bible say, you know, I wear polyester and cotton, am I going to hell? You know, they're just reading the book wrong. Leviticus is about the system of God's grace that he establishes, the sacrificial system that God wants you to partake in, that God wants you to see is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I mean, think about how elaborate that sacrificial system is. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Which day am I on? What holiday is this? What, what sacrifice do I have to offer? But if I offer a pigeon instead of a, a goat, is that bad? Wait, what about grain? I don't know. I can't keep up with all this. So as Christians, we're reading that, and we're like, oh my goodness, the Israelite, the typical Israelite, had to think about all these things. And look at me. I'm so fortunate that I have Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. All I have to do is go to Jesus Christ. He is the one-time offering for sin the one-time sacrifice that makes everything right. But then you realize how complicated Jesus' sacrifice is too. Jesus had to obey the law perfectly. Jesus had to die the death that we deserve by taking our sin, becoming sin himself so that we can become righteous. Do you see that? It's complicated. And yet Jesus does it for us. So the book of Hebrews is assuming that you know this, these things, okay? You know angels, you delivered the Ten Commandments, Moses received them and imparted them to the people, that Israel was stiff-necked, that they were not really listening to God all throughout the book of, of Numbers, in particular in Deuteronomy. And then you see that God established this sacrificial system to help Israel deal with their sin. Now, the outline of the book of Hebrews is exactly that. So let me show you this. 
In chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, Jesus is, we're told, is the radiance and exact imprint of God. In chapter 1 to 2, Jesus is superior to angels. If angels delivered the Ten Commandments, how much more than that Jesus came and told you with his mouth what to do? How much more then should you listen? Jesus, God himself, the radiance, the exact imprint of God. So there's a warning. The stakes are high if we ignore Jesus. You know, chapter three to four in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is more superior than Moses. And the warning is, if we ignore Moses, who is a prophet of God, the the mouthpiece of God, this great prophet of old, how much more are the stakes higher if we ignore Jesus? Jesus, the greatest prophet ever. You see, the the argument is lesser to greater. If Moses is great, Jesus is greater. If you ignore Jesus, the stakes are high. In in chapters 5 to 7, Jesus is superior to any priest or king, to any sacrificial system. The stakes are high if we reject Jesus, just like the stakes were high if an Israelite forgot to offer a sacrifice for his sin. What would they do? They would excommunicate him. They'd say, get out of here. We don't want to incur God's wrath. So if we don't trust in Jesus Christ, how much more will we incur God's wrath upon us? How much more are we likely to go to hell without Jesus Christ? Very likely. Because Jesus Christ, in chapters 8 to 10, offered the sacrifice that stumped all the other sacrifices ever. So you want to go to heaven... Chapters 8 to 10 tell you the only way to get there is through the the sacrifice that Jesus offered on our behalf. The one that he offered one time, and you know what it says? After he offered it, he sat down. Why? Because when he sat down, it meant, I don't ever have to offer this again. Priests are always standing. They're always wondering, oh my goodness, the Day of Atonement's coming. I'm really nervous. The people sinned. Jacob was over there, back over there. He stole something from his neighbor, and God's going to destroy us all. He's going to kill us all. Because one sin of an individual in the community, in the Old Testament, brought upon God's wrath on the whole community. Now, we see Jesus is sitting there, and he's saying, come to me. My burden is easy. If you've sinned, come to me. I offer forgiveness. Come to me, I, may, I give you life. I never have to offer another sacrifice again. So which system do you prefer? I prefer Jesus Christ. I think Jesus Christ's sacrifice is perfect. The Bible says that no other sacrifice can be made. So here's a warning. If you minimize Jesus' sacrifice in your life, the stakes are high. You can incur God's wrath. And then chapters 11 to 13 Uh, we see that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. What a beautiful, what a beautiful picture. He's not only the radiance and the imprint of God. He is the author, the perfecter of faith in God. And so the warning is the stakes are high if we don't endure in trusting God. So I hope you could just see briefly, the book of Hebrews is packed with the centrality of Jesus. But the book of Hebrews also shows us that Christian community is crucial and integral. It's an integral part of every believer's life. And so, if you look there in, your, in the, just the way I've outlined the book, chapters eight to 10 is where we get our text from this morning. It's where we see that in the midst of Jesus' sacrifice, there's this community of faith. When Jesus offers a sacrifice, he's, he offers that sacrifice for that community of faith that through that sacrifice, he can call people to himself from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation that says Jesus Christ is Lord. And so that's Sheridan Hills this morning. We are that community. And so I want us to see that this message, this community life, these good works are very, very important for Sheridan Hills as a community. And I'm speaking primarily to Covenant Church members. If you're not a Covenant Church member of Sheridan Hills, Tune in, because this is important for you. You might be wondering at the end of this, I'm not really a part of any church community. I'm not part of any, whether it's Sheridan Hills or any other community. I'm really not a part of any of God's people. 
I, I mean, for far too long, I've kind of been doing this Lone Ranger Christianity thing. And I want you to see the beauty of Christian community. So this, let's turn our eyes now to the, the text. Let's zoom in a little bit and see that our passage begins with this word, therefore. So just write that in. Therefore, in verse 19, it, it shows us a major shift in the letter to application, personal application. And so we ask the question, how shall we live in light of what we have heard about Jesus? How shall we live in light of what we've heard about Jesus Christ? And so there's, there's two ways we can answer this question. We can answer it on an individual basis. What does this mean for me, okay? Uh, typically, you know, when we read a letter, we can, we can ask that. We can say, what does this letter mean for me? Or a better way to think about this is what does this mean for the church? What does this mean for a community? So we can answer this question on an individual basis and or um, as a community. So here the application is for the new covenant community of God. The new covenant community of God formed through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his church. Okay, I want you to see that's important. Therefore, that word just you know, triggers all this. So as covenant church members of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, we must ask, what does this text mean for us as a church? What does this mean for us as a church? And in the first place, it means that we have to obey the commands that God gives us as a community. We have to obey the commands that Jesus gives us. Now, there's three commands in this passage. I want you to see that. Uh, when you say, let us, let us, let us, three times. And the first two have to do with God and the gospel. So outside of us, God and the gospel. And the last one, the third one that I talked about, which emphasizes love, the greatest command, has to do with each other, us, subjectively, one-on-one, -on -one, in a community, in a group, has to do with how we look at each other. So in the first place, we need to ask this question, how should we relate to God? and the gospel, and there's two ways we relate to God and the gospel, and, and we need to obey this as a community. The first one is, the first command is this, let us draw near, let us draw near. You see that? That's in verse 22. And now my question, you know, every time I read this, I think, why didn't he just add what we need should draw near to? But throughout this letter, he's been saying to you, to us, draw near to God. So draw near to what? to God, draw near to God. Now, you see that in Hebrews 4.16 and Hebrews 7.19 and 10.1, 11.6. Those are all the references there. You can go home and read those. How do you draw near to God as a covenant community? You draw near to God the way we did this morning at the beginning of our service, through his word and through worship. Right now, what you should be doing, what you, what you should be thinking of is God's word shaping you to worship God. His word shaping our worship. So how do you draw near to God? You draw near through his word. You also draw near through Jesus Christ. How do we draw near? To, do you remember in Isis's testimony, she said, a year ago I prayed in the name of Jesus Christ to give me a covenant community, a church community, that will love me and that will teach me the Bible. It is through Jesus Christ that we draw near to God and only through Jesus Christ that we can draw near to God. There is no other way. In fact, Jesus told us that there is no other way to draw near to God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through me. So do you understand how to draw near to God? Do we as a church community know how to draw near to God? And every time, I, every time we sing, I'm so encouraged by our church, and you should be too, hearing other people around you. You know, some are making joyful noises, they're not really singing. Others are singing, and we're drawing near. We're drawing near to God. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Can you underline that? He will draw near to you. When we draw near to God, he draws near to us. I think also about drawing near to God in terms of a lifeline, don't you? 
when, when we're so thirsty, when life is so difficult, you know, the psalmists describe nearness to God as their good. They draw near, they drink, just like a deer draws near to water, because it gives life. Do you draw near to God? The second command here is, let us hold fast. And this time he tells us what to hold fast to. And he says, hold fast to the confession of our hope. Hold fast to the confession of our hope. Jude 3 tells us a little bit more, explains a little bit more what we mean by confession of our hope. In Jude 3, Jude writes, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, you can underline common salvation, that's our hope, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So you circle common salvation and the faith delivered once and for all to the saints. Uh, in fact, the confession of our hope, this, this word to hold fast, happens a couple of times in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, in Hebrews chapter 4, 16, in Hebrews chapter 6, 18, and here in, he, in chapter 10, verse 23. And we, it's the idea of, and he says, without wavering, holding on to something so tightly, you get white knuckles. Have you ever held on to something so tightly that you have white knuckles? How, how tight are you holding it? You know, I think about my boy's little arm when I'm in a parking lot. You know, I'm holding fast. I don't want to let that go. Well, I don't want to let his arm go. Because what will happen if I let him go? A car is going to swerve around the corner going 50 miles an hour and, you know, bullseye right, right over Noah. I mean, that's what I think, right? That's what you think. So I hold on to his hand very tightly. And in this case, we're holding on to the gospel, the common salvation. I was having a conversation with somebody this past week, and they were explaining to me that this is what their life looks like as a Christian. And I, I just had to look at this person and say, that is not normal for Christians to act that way. You have not been holding fast to Jesus Christ. You think you have, but Jesus Christ is not some leftover. Jesus Christ is the one who we grab his, his ankles. We say, I'm never gonna let go. I've tasted, I've seen. This is good. I think of you know, Mary and Martha. Mary is sitting at Jesus. Every time you hear Mary in the, in the Gospels, she's always sitting at Jesus' feet. What is she doing? She's holding fast to everything he's saying. Do you hold fast to, to God? As a covenant community, do we hold fast to Jesus Christ, his word? Is the word of God the only thing that matters to us? Is the word of God the central characteristic, the, the central thing that characterizes this church? I hope so. I hope it is, and I hope it remains that way. It has for 55 years. And I hope for another 55 years it will. Hold fast to the confession of our hope. Hold fast without wavering. Hold fast because he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. And so we come to the most important part of this message, which is how can Christian community help Sheridan Hills Baptist Church? And the rest of the sermon is pretty much a plug for all of our small groups. So growth groups, community groups, and all of the other various groups, men's boot camp, ladies in the word, small group prayers that ladies have in our church, uh, small group prayers that men have in our church, one-on-one uh, -on -one discipleship, that is what we're going to see in these next couple of points. So there's four things I want us to see about how Christian community can help Sheridan Hills. Okay, so let's just go quickly through these. In the first place, Christian community, and this is in verse 24 and 25, Christian community is the primary way, is the primary way for Christians to develop love and good works. It's the primary way that we can show love and good works. Now, what do I mean by Christian community? Christian community, has there's two dimensions to this. There's the larger church gathering, which is non-negotiable. This morning, this Sunday morning, is a non-negotiable if you're a true Christian. Gathering with other believers in Christ 
is so essential to your faith. Is so essential to your faith. True Christians join together in worship. True Christians join together in worship. It's essential. Large community, large church gathering is non-negotiable, whether it's this church or whether it's another church. What about this other dimension, the smaller church gathering? The smaller church gatherings are imperative. They're imperative. So this larger church gathering is non-negotiable. And when we look at small church gatherings, we think that is so crucial. It's important. It's it's imper- I mean, where else are you going to love and to do good? I mean, you're not doing that right now. Are you looking at your neighbor and talking to them right now and saying, hey, he just said that we should love one another. Let's love one another. You, you don't elbow the person next to you and do that, do you? So how can you spur one another on here this morning? Well, you're hearing God's word, but more practically in these small groups where you're actually having conversations with one another, exchanging words and ideas, you are going to rub shoulders with one another more than you do in Sunday morning gathering. God's word through one person is coming to you in this larger church gathering. We're singing songs to one another. We're encouraging one another. We're admonishing one another through songs. But it is in these smaller church gatherings where we see this played out. And we see it played out this way. In the care that we have for each other, true Christians care for each other. And so there I've, I've labeled a couple of things, growth groups, community groups, men's boot camp, ladies in the word, meals, trips together, life together, counseling. Those are all ways that we need to do, we need to follow as Christians to care for, for each other. Um, the, one, of the, one of the important things here to note is that this phrase, good works, as I mentioned, happens six times in the New Testament. And when we're talking about good works, we need to see that part of our work as a Christian is to be part of these small groups, is to be part of caring for one another in these small groups. So I want to help you see this is the way that it's supposed to work. Uh, One of the ways I want to do that is through a a great book that has just come out recently by Ed Welch. We did um, a book with men's boot camp, and some of the ladies did this, um, uh, a small book about a big problem, and he talks about anger there. But I want you to see this. Ed Welch, and the book is called Caring for One Another. It'll be available in our bookstore. You can go and grab this. It's $4. It's $4. So just grab this. And he talks about eight ways to care for one another practically in small group settings. One-on-one, over the phone, just right here after church on Sunday. And here's what he says. God uses ordinary people and their increasingly wise, childlike, God-dependent conversations to build his church. These do not depend on our brilliance in order to be helpful. They depend on Jesus, his strength, our weakness, and our humble response to him. How can you care for each other? It is through these groups. Now, let's look a little bit more particular, particular ways to care for each other. Number two, Christian community can help us deal with major issues we each face today. Christian community can help us deal with with major issues we each face today. Now, probably the reason why he says at the end of this passage where we read drawing, the day drawing near, we should encourage each other all the more since the day is drawing near. Uh, He's referring to the day of judgment, the day of Jesus Christ's second appearing where he makes everything perfect and calls to himself his righteous people. Now think think about just a couple of various categories that we each face each day. And I want you to see that these are things that we face Today, this very day, September 30th, the first thing that we deal with, and this is on a daily basis, listen to this, evil and sinfulness. Evil and sinfulness. Hebrews, 13, uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that, uh, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Christian community can help you stay out of sin, can help you avoid evil. What about this one? Stress and suffering. How can Christian community help you 
in stress and suffering. When Sophia was born just, a couple, just four months ago, um, I can't, I mean, we were, Esther and I were, were kind of shaken by the whole thing, and it was stressful, and it was a form of suffering. I mean, we didn't know what was going to happen. In some sense, in some ways, we still don't know what's going to happen. But let me tell you what Christian community did for us. In the first month and a half after Sophia was born, many of you came and brought meals each day. And we had meals for a month and a half. There was one less thing to worry about, what we're going to eat. And sometimes it didn't even feel like we wanted to eat. I mean, Manette brought over some Jamaican food. Amen. I, I mean, we had, we had the ginger beer. She made the ginger beer. She had the rice. And then she had some jerk chicken. I, th- I mean, I'll never forget that. I mean, I wrote it in my journal. I said, Manette, jerk chicken, rice, ginger beer. Never forget, you know. Others of you gave us gift card. A, the, a dear sister in our church gave us gift cards to this restaurant in the hospital that we're still using today. And I just, I look at that and I said, I think Christian community has made all the difference in our suffering, in our stress. Uh, What about medical bills? I mean, some of you have had medical bills in this church and another member has come and said, let me pay for that. Let me cover that for you. What about rent? Some of you had had rent. You couldn't pay. And a member in the church said, I'm going to cover that. Don't worry about this month. Don't worry about paying me back. What about Sheridan Hills Christian School? There's some families in this church that by the the graciousness and the donations and the love of other church members, their students can go to the school without having to worry about tuition. I just think about all these ways that Christian community affects us. Stress, suffering, evil, sinfulness. What about this last one? Distraction, neglect, negligence. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 tells us that we shouldn't neglect one another. We're going to look at that in a minute. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, let us lay, every, lay, let us lay every, aside every obstacle. And I think what he means there is just like what a runner has to do, they have to clear their mind before they run this marathon, right? They have to, they have to think, they have to get engaged, they have to focus. You're not going to run a marathon thinking about, okay, what are the bills I got to pay? Um, what are the, the major political things going on in the world? Uh, what are... Uh, you know, what is NASA doing in space? You're not going to think about those things when you're running. You're going to be focused on the track just in front of you, just five feet in front of you for four or five hours. That's what you're going to do, intense focus. And so the writer to the, the Hebrews says, let aside all these obstacles. Follow Jesus without distractions. Now, Sherry Turkle, she's a sociologist uh, who wrote a great book called Alone Together. She's not Christian, but she wrote this great book, and she, she's making observations about culture, and she's saying, this, in, in this book, Alone Together, she talks about how we have become so attached to our phones, it has become a third self. We're so attached to our phones, she, she calls it the third self. On your phone, you entrust some of your greatest secrets. You tell your phone more things than you tell your spouse. Did you know that? I mean, when you ask Google questions, why don't you ask your spouse, you know? Well, you know, at what point is fever bad for a baby? You know, I should be asking Esther, not Google. You know, she's, she's going to look at me and she's going to think, what are you doing? Google is not reliable in many ways. And in many ways it is, but in many ways it's not. Or what about this one? The Chick-fil-A phenomenon. Or, you know, you enter whatever restaurant, your preferred one. You walk into your favorite restaurant... And without a doubt, at any time, any place, there's a table with four people, and they're hanging out, and they're all on their phones. <laughs> Have you ever seen this? I call it the Chick-fil-A phenomenon. Every time I walk into Chick-fil-A, there's a group of four people on their phones, 
commenting to each other on their social medias about what they're doing at that moment, and they're wanting each other to look at it and like it, in person and virtually. <laughs> it's the strangest phenomenon. And it has to do with the distraction that we have made habitual. Look at this next part here in verse 24, not neglecting to meet, as is the habit of some. It's, it's really easy to defer. It's really easy to make a habit of something that seems natural, right? You know, uh, what, what are some things that seem natural to us? Uh, one thing that seems natural to you uh, might be after a long day's work, just sit down and turn on the TV and tune everything else out. That's a natural thing to do. Uh, nobody's pressuring you. There's no resistance there. And you're just kind of reacting to the day. You're saying, I, I need this. I, I need this. Have you, have you realized that the most things that are worth pursuing are actually really not natural to us? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that the things that we want in life, the things that are hard to get, are not, don't really come natural to us? Learning a new language? Oh, some of you, it's natural. I mean, for some of us, it's not. So don't judge us. We judge you. Because it's easier for you to learn a language than it is for us. But have you ever noticed that it's worth learning another language? If you're in South Florida, it's probably worth learning to speak Spanish, and yet it is so hard. Why? Because you're not naturally inclined to do that. Now, if you were, you could learn it very quickly. Uh, what about this? Driving the speed limit. Why is it so hard to make a habit, especially when there are penalties against you? I mean, I was in a speed zone the other day, and this guy was honking me. It was 50 miles an hour, the light was, you know, I made sure the light was flashing, and I was going 50 miles an hour to the dot, and this guy behind me was so enraged, he was honking, he's like, go, go! And then he just, at the chance he got, he just turned around, I mean, he just cut me off and drove on his way. I mean, I hope he didn't know that was a speed limit, you know, zone. But why is it so hard, even when there are penalties imposed on us, why is it so hard to follow the law? Why is it so hard to, to make a habit of things? And here's why. It is easy for us to do what we most like to do that has the least resistance. The easiest thing for us to do has the least, the least resistance. H habits, as a result of natural tendencies, break hard. It is very hard to be in Christian community because our natural tendency is to be self-focused, to be selfish to not think about others, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. It is very natural for us to look, just like the sociologist Sherry Turkle said, it is very easy for us to look at something like a third self, to create this, this self that's imaginary, and it's on our phones, and every time I'm in a social setting where I'm anxious, I just, oh, this is medication for me. It's easy, it's easy to, to seclude yourself. It's easy to fall back. And so, the writer to the Hebrews knows this. He knows it's hard for you to confront a brother who's in sin. It's hard to get in the car, drive over to a hospital, and visit somebody. It's hard to come to church Sunday morning after I've worked all the way until midnight, Saturday night. It's hard to come be with other brothers and sisters early in the morning for prayer because prayer doesn't really, hasn't really answered anything immediately in my life. It's easy for us to do those things. But what is hard is this. It's the difference between proactive and reactive community. Have you ever noticed that when something bad happens, we tend to react surprised, like we didn't know it was gonna happen? In proactive communities, in proactive Christian communities, we focus on preventing major problems before they appear. So in a proactive community, something bad happens. There's a sin in the church. Just use that one. There's a sin in the church. And a proactive community says, we knew, because the book of Hebrews told us that if we don't encourage one another to holiness, that we will each fall into sin. Our hearts are deceitful. So we plan for this, and here's how we plan for it. When a brother sins, instead of judging him, we're gonna go and be alongside of him. We're gonna love him. 
Because the most important thing he needs right now is God's grace in his life to confront that sin. We're proactive. Now a reactive community, a, a reactive Christian community is this. It's one that focuses on addressing major problems after something unfortunate has happened. Yeah, like you know this is true because you, you give a two-year-old a bottle or a cup, a glass cup, much less, a glass cup filled with liquid that will stain permanently anything it touches. And you say to him, all right, I'm going to hand you this cup with grape juice in it. I trust you. You're going to do great. And the two-year-old is so excited, and in their excitement, they swoosh the thing everywhere, and it stains everything. And you look at him, and you're like, I can't believe that happened. That shouldn't have happened. I gave you clear instructions. And you react. In a community, in a Christian community where sin happens, you can imagine what happens. When a brother or sister sins in a church community, here's what happens. We judge them. You shouldn't be like that. You're holy. You should be perfect. We react. What about prayer? For three months, you don't pray. Then something tragic happens. And then for the next three months, you pray. What about praying for three months so that when something tragic happens, you can look back at those three months and say, oh, the Lord is here. Oh, I know it. For three months before, when things were going great, God was with me. And now, when things are going bad, I'm still going to pray. Really, that's the default for me now. I've learned. I've made it a habit. What about coming to church? What about this? Coming to church in a proactive community. You, you're here, you're invested, you're plugged in, you're loving, you're caring, you're sharing the burdens of others. And then something happens, tragedy happens. Or you're experiencing stress, or you're experiencing distraction, neglect. And then somebody in the church who you've invested sh you know, shoots you a text message and says, hey, where are you? I miss you. I I've been thinking about you all week. Uh, let's get together for a cup of coffee. Let's pray together as opposed to a reactive community where you've neglected the church for so long that something happens and it, it happens and, and you're so offended that the church didn't reach out to you. And then you come to the church and you're like, you know, my name is so-and-so and here's what's happening in my life. And, and we, we kind of look at that and we look and we say, wait, who are you? <laughs> I've been a member at Sharon Hills for 15 years. How many times have you come to the church? Uh, you could be a member for 15 years and come to the church once. Hopefully not. Starting point helps with seeing people into membership who are going to be committed to the life of the church for 20, 30, 40 years. That's what we're looking for. But when I'm in a Christian community, a proactive Christian community, I'm going, to, I'm going to, it's going to be hard for me to neglect the church. It's going to be hard for other brothers and sisters to let me go. Now, if you find yourself in that situation where it's hard for people to let you go, praise God. This is God's grace at work. These are good works. Brothers and sisters are, are committing to you to love you. Now, if you're, in a, if you're in a reactive situation, if you're in a reactive situation at this church where things happen and nobody knows, Get plugged in. Grow with others. Invest in others. Join a growth group. These have been vehicles of prayer. Come Wednesday nights. Put your name in a lifeline, our prayer, our little blue sheet prayer lifeline. Uh, send an email to the church. Say, hey, this is my great need now. The Bible promotes proactive Christian community. In fact, God only knows what's going to happen to each of our lives. Only God knows what will happen after we get out of here, walk into that parking lot and drive home. Only God knows. You don't know, I don't know. But in a proactive community, we can love one another, we can prepare, we can care for one another. I, th I just think of this past week, I, I got a text message from Gerard in our church. 
member in our church, and he said, hey, just thinking about you and the family, praying that everything is going well. I, I think about Ray Martinez this past Wednesday. I was walking out of church, and he, and he said, Pastor Ben, and he came up to me, and he shared scripture with me and told me he's praying for me. I think about our time, Esther and I spent some time with Krista, and we're just so encouraged by her faith in the Lord this past week. Or think about Eli and Marie Arias, who gladly welcomed us into their home for a year and a half, where Eli taught me how to do woodworking, and where Eli cared and, and shared some things with me, and I was able to share and ask for prayer, and the wisdom and the insight they imparted. Um, I, you know, I spoke with Margie Serrato yesterday, who brought a meal to a, a woman in great, dire need. You know, I think about the women in our church who gather together and pray over the phone or in person. I think about the senior adults, lunch bunch. I get a card from them every single week saying, we're praying for you. That's proactive community. That is community at work. So when I sin, when I am stressed, when I'm suffering, when I'm struggling to, to remain focused, when I'm distracted, when I'm neglecting something, I got brothers and sisters who are gonna say, we got you, we're here for you, we care for you. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, if you need anything, give me a call in the last four months. Several hundred times, I think. And that's the way it should be in a proactive Christian community. The third thing is, Christian community can help us think Per, more purposefully about others. Think more purposefully about others. When you think of the word consider, consider one another. Consider how to spur one another on to good works, to love and to good works. There is an intentional thinking, pondering, observing, contemplating, reflecting upon an individual that we have in view here. When you are told, let's consider, when we're commanded, let's consider, we're told, pick somebody in your mind and think about them for a week. How many of you do that? How many of you sit and intentionally think about a person throughout the week? Maybe you do this with your kids, with your spouse. What about another church member? Thinking about how can I live in such a way where this person who I'm connected with at church will grow in Christ-likeness? Ask that. Maybe write that question down. How can I think about this person and fill in the blank in such a way where they, where my life is for the purpose of helping them be more like Christ? I mean, think about that for people around you this morning, in your growth group this morning. Think about how can you consider others? Maybe it's a card. Maybe you write a card, maybe a letter. Maybe it's a meal. Maybe it is intentionally planning to spend time and get to know somebody in the church. Maybe it's reading through a book of the Bible together and thinking about how can I help this person or how can I serve this person? What about prayer, praying for people? I mean, there's several ways we can care for each other by considering each other. I, I wrote several relationships down uh, underneath that you can think of church member to church member. What about this one? Husband and wife, have you considered your spouse lately? Is everything about you in your marriage? Or is your life meant to serve? Your purpose in life is to serve your spouse? What about this one, child and parent? Maybe this one a little too much. Maybe we focus too much on our children. But have you ever thought as a child whether you care for your parents? Maybe you're a grown child. Maybe you're a child in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. Have you ever thought about how can I consider my parents? What about this one, Christian to non-Christian? Have you ever thought about how can I live in such a way where the purpose of my life demonstrates my love and care for non-Christians? How can I live in such a way that my life shows the purpose of my life is to love and care for non-Christians, sharing the gospel with them? That will radically change our evangelism, won't it? If you think about that, you're gonna share the gospel. Maybe once a week, hopefully daily, as you're going, Matthew tells us, Matthew 28. And so Christian community can help us think more purposefully about others. And finally, number four, Christian community can help us speak truthfully and lovingly. Help us speak truthfully 
and lovingly. Now, oftentimes churches are, they focus too much on this first word, which is stir up. And it's actually, a stir up is a good word for it, but it, it's actually a negative word. It, it means to incite, to anger, to irritate, or to provoke. <laughs> so you're called to consider how to provoke, to incite, to stir up, to spur on, to irritate other Christians. Amen. Some of you are like, yes, I needed a Bible verse for what I do to other Christians, and there it is. And, and I think what, what uh, the writer to the Hebrews has in mind here is this confrontation. When we read in the book of Proverbs 27, for instance, that iron sharpens iron. I mean, you probably have that Bible verse somewhere saved on your, you know, you probably Facebooked it, you know, iron sharpens iron. Have you ever seen iron shaping iron? Do you know how it shapes other iron? How? You gotta smash that thing. It won't move unless you smash it, unless you see sparks. You're not hitting hard enough unless you see sparks. And so when we see iron sharpens iron, that's not just a sweet metaphor, it's, a, it's an intense metaphor. Just like iron is shaped by the constant bashing and sparking and hitting and inciting and chaotic shaping that iron does, so you should do the same thing with other Christians. Now, keep in mind the principles that Jesus said, don't be doing this if you've got a log in your eye. I mean, if you got a log in your eye and you go to take somebody's speck out, Jesus says, you're gonna knock them over. I mean, they're, gonna, they're not gonna see the, the, the light of day for months. You might knock them into a coma. When you got a log sticking out of your eye, the principle is take out that log first. Use the judgment that you would use on others. Incite yourself before you incite others. How can you do that in a Christian community? Well, you're gonna do this in, in a couple of ways. Number one, you're gonna confront in love. You're going to look at other brothers and sisters and you're gonna say, as long as it's called today, we have the chance to turn away from sin. Brother and sister, I'm praying for you. I'm praying in particular that God would keep you from stumbling into sin. Pray for people in the church. What about this one? How do we stir one another up in suffering? How do we stir one another up in suffering? We help each other think about where God is in suffering and how we are to respond in suffering. We help each other think about where God is and how we ought to respond. What about when we're distracted? Have you ever called another brother or sister in this church and said, can you please pray for me? I've got so much going on in my life right now. I need help. I need you to pray that God would protect me from all these distractions that I have in my life. Pray, pray for me. Have you done that in humility? You stir each other up by confronting by encouraging, by, by strengthening one another. And in fact, he says there, encouraging one another. And here we have the idea of supporting, motivating, comforting, urging, maybe counseling. How do we encourage one another? I think one of the best ways to encourage somebody in Sheridan Hills today after the church, think of Bible verses and tell somebody a Bible verse. Say, hey, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's God's word. In your presence, in God's presence is fullness of joy. At your pleasures are right, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what I'm thinking about right now. I'm praying that for you. I'm thinking, I want, you know, I want Ricardo, I want him to hear the, be the best pleasure you have is at just being right near to God. I want other people who are sitting in the balcony, I can't see anybody in the balcony right now. I want you to hear each other say to each other, I'm praying this scripture for you. You need this scripture. How do you encourage, how do you support, how do you motivate, how do you comfort others in this church? And so, unfortunately, there are many ways that this can go wrong, right? You know, there's churches that are too focused on stirring one another up. They're judgmental. And there's too many churches also that just focus on encouraging each other. We don't confront because Jesus says to not judge. And we don't, we don't have any standards. And because we don't have standards, we just love everybody. No, those two things are, are, are not 
mutually exclusive things. Sheridan Hills is called to say, let's stir up one another. Let's confront each other. Let's, let's do this in love. Let's sharpen each other. Let's encourage each other. Let's care for each other. Let's comfort each other at the same time. So while you're confronting, you're encouraging. While you're inciting, you're counseling. While you're urging, stirring up, you're also sympathizing and empathizing. Isn't that a great picture of Christian community? Doesn't the book of Hebrews help us see Christian community very differently than we, what, what, what we might expect? So as a final challenge to you as we close, a final challenge, will you jump into Christian community at Sheridan Hills? Will you jump into Christian community? And in particular, will you join a growth group? Will you be a part of a small group at this church, a group, a growth group, a men's boot camp, a ladies in the word. They're happening all the time. There's a calendar you can look at. Tonight, if you're a covenant member, you can come tonight and hear about what God is doing in our church. Finally, will you join a community group? I want you to take a couple minutes now and answer that question. Will I do it? In light of the word that community is the primary way Christians work. That Christian community can help us deal with major problems. That Christian community can help us think purposely about others. And that Christian community can help us speak truthfully and lovingly. Will you do that now? Will you say yes or no? Uh, don't, don't be middle. Don't say, don't be wavering. Say yes, I will join a growth group. I will join community groups for, my, for the sake of my soul and for the sake of others. I think when we do that, when we are truly part of Christian community, I think what will happen is the church will be blessed, it will grow in its spiritual knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will grow in breath, the Lord will bless our gatherings, we'll see people come to the Lord in faith, we'll see people becoming holier, we'll see people getting baptized, we'll see people becoming members, and we'll be encouraged. So let's pray to that end. Let me pray for us.